أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Tonight إن شاء الله I will continue the discussion that we started yesterday. We covered this verse from سورة الفصيلة and the other one I touched upon it briefly from سورة الطلاق. Uh, and uh, I plan, inshallah ta'ala, to take you on this relatively quick journey um, across the universe, across the world of uh, physics. We will uh, make stops at uh, um, string theory, uh, super string theory, uh, the M theory, the super gravity theory, um, the Higgs boson, the, the Hadron uh, uh, collider that was built in Geneva, the God's particle, and all these a fancy um, terms of physics uh, that I think uh, most of you probably have not heard of before, although uh, in July 3rd of last year, uh, when they caused those two particles to collide in Geneva, it was actually dubbed the most consequential day in the history of science. Uh, and so it was, it was more remarkable than uh, uh, Newton's discovery of gravity was more remarkable than uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. It was more remarkable than, uh, uh, um, than the discovery of the nuclear bomb. Uh, and uh, yet most Muslims don't know anything about that. And that obviously disheartens me. Uh, and I, I take pride, inshallah ta'ala, that many of you will leave the masjid tonight going off and saying to people the first time in my life, I studied and, and learned about uh, string theory and M theory was at my masjid from my imam. Uh, because that doesn't happen very often. Uh, and people think that the, the, the discourse at the masajid should be confined uh, to the spiritual truths of the world and the hereafter. And I say, uh, without having a good grasp on the physical world in which you live, you shall never be able to attain or acquire a strong relationship with the Creator. So I will go, inshallah, uh, across this journey quickly, <coughs> and then I will swing back to the two verses from Surah Fusilat and Surah at talaq and establish, inshallah, the connection. Again, what I have in mind is not to prove that the Quran is a document of science that has proven science or validated science or was validated by science. My point is to establish what I've been repeatedly saying, and that is the true miracle of the Qur'an is that it is compatible with all the truths of the world that are accepted by the majority of people in any time, in any generation, and across any geographical location. So the entirety of humanity at any age would agree, on, according to its, its limitations on science and technology or whatever, would agree uh, that, certain, that certain facts are truths of science. You will find that the Qur'an is still compatible with that. And a thousand years from today, when what we consider absolute science becomes uh, a thing of the past, the Qur'an will still be compatible with it until the Day of Judgment. And on the Day of Judgment, we'll be, we will be exposed to the absolute truth. Because whatever we study in this world is just relative truth. Okay? It is, it is a, a, per, a perspective on the truth rather than the truth itself. Only on the Day of Judgment that we will be exposed to the truth. Now. Let's start, inshallah, with station number one, and that is string theory. What is string theory? Uh, I, I briefly uh, talked to you a little bit about it yesterday night, and I said that uh, uh, physics, uh, you know, uh, particle physics, that is, for, for the longest time suggested that uh, the, uh, uh, the atom is basically composed of a nucleus uh, and electrons that uh, rotate around it. And what makes metals and objects and matter very different is the variation of the number of protons and electrons, right? So hydrogen, for example, has, you know, whatever, one proton. Uh, and then you have iron that has a larger, much larger number of protons. So it's, it's only the number, the, the, the difference between the number of protons is what causes matter to change form 
and so forth. You have human flesh, you have aluminum, you have plastic, you have wood, you have carpet, you have air, whatever. It is all dependent on the number of protons and neutrons um, inside the nucleus of the atom. And then further, on, they went on and basically said to us that, you know, wait a second, that is actually not the complete truth. Uh, that protons and neutrons are also composed of much smaller subparticles that uh, physicists called, you remember? Quarks, right? The up quark and the down quark and this and that top quark and the bottom quark. Uh, there's different kinds of quarks if, if you are a physics uh, a freak such as myself. Uh, and, and if you study those things, you realize, okay, so quarks, that's much smaller than, uh, than protons and, uh, and neutrons. And then in the 1970s, uh, based on research that was done by earlier uh, physicists, even from the time of Einstein himself, they uh, started to argue that uh, matter is not actually made of quarks because quarks are made of smaller, not a particle, not a smaller particle, but made of very, very fine filaments of energy that vibrate on a regular basis. Okay? They call them strings. I don't, I don't know if you've ever read about that or seen anything uh, in, in a Discovery Channel documentary, but it's basically a string or a chord that is very similar to the string of a cello or a guitar or a violin, right? When you pluck at it, it produces a sound, okay? So that frequency of vibration is what determines everything that exists in our universe, okay? Now they say, uh, and this is very interesting, and bear this in mind because this will reveal an amazing truth at the end of the khatr, <coughs> inshallah. The frequency of vibration of all of those filaments, all of those strings, is uniform across our universe. So they all vibrate, all those small little filaments. So think of it this way, you have this filament that is constantly vibrating like this, right? Constantly vibrating. And it's vibrating at a uniform velocity or uniform frequency across matter. Okay? Now, they also realized that for this to mathematically work, they ran all of their equations on paper and it works. But it doesn't work in the universe that is composed of four dimensions. Remember from Einstein's theory, he argued that our universe is made up of four dimensions. Uh, you have, we can move, at, in any plane we can move back and forth, we can move right and left, and then we can move up and down, right? Uh, width, breadth, and height. And then he added the fourth dimension, which is time, right? So you have width, breadth, height, and time. In order for string theory to work mathematically, they realized that we would need to add not one and not two, but six other dimensions. To the four that already exist, we need to add six dimensions. So for, the, for string theorists, and that is the 1970s and early 80s, they believed that the universe, our universe, is made of vibrating filaments that move back and forth to and fro and ten other, in ten other directions, right? And that the universe is actually made of ten dimensions. And, and again, I know that our minds, our brains, are so accustomed to the idea that there are only three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension, and that is time. So it's so hard for us to conceptualize six additional dimensions. It is impossible for us to understand it, and even most physicists don't even understand that yet. But think of it as dimensions at the very microscopic level. They are very, almost impossible. You can't see them, right? We can see their effect. We can calculate the, 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 the math and, and realize that it's actually true. Uh, but we can't necessarily uh, figure it out or conceptualize it in our minds. Now, so you have those strings that vibrate with uniform frequency, and, they vibra and, and the direction of their vibration is entirely dependent on the uh, uh, angle and the shape of the dimension in which they are moving back and forth. And I know that uh, it is hard for most of us to conceptualize this, but I'm just opening the door for you guys to go and study. This is pretty fascinating stuff, and it has to do with our existence and our world, and we cannot afford that our kids will be studying this in, in middle school, and we don't know anything about it, okay? What really makes a difference as far as the shapes of matter um, are concerned is not the frequency of vibration, but rather the direction of the, or the angle 
of, of, of the dimension. Okay? So for, for the frequency of vibration to produce plastic or rubber, for example, it vibrates in this direction because the, the, the movement is limited by those dimensions. And in order for it to produce metal, for instance, it, it would vibrate in this direction. So think of dimensions as creating a limitation of movement on the, the, the vibration of the filaments and based on how those dimensions interlace with each other, the vibration will give rise to metal, will give rise to human flesh, will give rise to air, will give rise to anything in the universe. In fact, and this is established science now, the vibration of the strings gives rise to everything in the universe. Not just matter, think of electromagnetic fields, think of photons of light, think of gravity, think of anything and everything in this universe at the very core level is made of those vibrating filaments. The motion and the direction of motion of which is defined and determined and restricted by the ten dimensions. Now something really bad happened to string theory. It divided up into not one or two but five different alternative theories because they disagreed on the math. And that was about to basically put the string theory to death until something amazing happened in 1994 at the University of Southern California. It was this amazing physicist who is as important, if not a lot more important than Einstein himself. His name is Edward Witten. And Edward Witten, Ed Witten they call him, he, it was basically a conference of physicists at USC, 1994, and he made this remarkable pronouncement that shook the wave, that shook the, the world of science forever. And in his announcement, he basically said that I have uh, discovered the overarching theory of the universe, the theory that explains everything. He called it the theory of everything. Uh, uh, and, and in that theory, he basically argued that the five alternatives of str string theory are basically just five angles looking at the same exact thing. And the only way for you guys to agree mathematically on one unifying theory is by adding an eleventh dimension. So it is not 10, it is actually 11 dimensions including time. And it is only through the 11th dimension that the math of string theory would make perfect sense. All of this again in, 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 the, in the mid 90s was proven mathematically but they have not gone into the laboratory yet to prove this and, and to make, basically call it actual science. So it, at that point it still looked like philosophy. Uh, and inshallah, I'll tell you when it became actual, <coughs> actual science. What Ed Witten added to this discussion was something quite remarkable. He said that it is not just strings that vibrate. There's also something else that vibrates at that very core microscopic level, and that is a membrane. There are those membranes that are constantly vibrating. So it's not a little filament anymore. Filaments do exist, but there's also this membrane that keeps vibrating like this. And those membranes are connected to each other and they're expanded throughout the entire universe. And all the vibrating membrane of our universe exists within the 11th dimension. And I know it's hard for us, you know, just average common people who have not necessarily studied physics to take a good, get a good grasp of these complex concepts. But if you spend the next few days reading up about it and watching videos on YouTube, inshallah, I think you'll, you'll get a pretty a good understanding. You'll be fascinated as I was. So here we are existing on this massive, massive membrane that vibrates within the 11th dimension of our universe. Okay? So far, interesting, but theoretical. And then came this physis physicist. Uh, her name is Lisa something. I don't remember her last name. And she was studying gravity. And she was fascinated with the notion that gravity compared to electromagnetic force is very, very weak. How many of you would agree that gravity is weak? Is gravity weak? Is it strong? So if I, if I hold a, a, a pen, for example, and I throw it, it falls. Gravity pulls it down, right? Which force is pulling this pen down? The gravity that is coming from Earth, planet Earth, planet Earth, this huge planet, right, is using its gravitational force to keep the pen stable in its place, okay? But yet, 
I can just do this, use two of my fingers and pick it up. Is gravity strong or weak? It's very, very weak. Gravity is actually one of the weakest forces of the universe. In fact, they say that electromagnetic force is one to the power of 39 times stronger than the force of gravity. This is a very, very big number, okay? So gravity is extremely weak, and Lisa, whatever her last name was, was extremely fascinated with, with why gravity is, is so weak. Now, when Ed Witten came up with membrane theory, that provided her with an answer to her question. She basically thought of our universe existing on this vibrating membrane with filaments that are attached to the membrane and vibrating. She studied all the different forms of filaments, all the different forms of strings, and she realized that there's only one form of string that is not attached to the membrane. It rather forms a complete circle. So it is floating on top of the membrane and vibrating constantly. And that is the filaments that make up gravity. If filaments are attached to the membrane, they're not going to go anywhere. But if they are attached to gravity, what's going to happen? They will float back and forth and possibly enter into other membranes. Wow, other membranes. If our entire universe exists on a membrane, if we talk of other membranes, then we're talking about other universes. We're talking about other universes, other forms of existence that are right here with us, but the only difference between them and us is that they vibrate at a different, different frequency. Because everything that vibrates within our existence vibrates at uniform frequency. It's just the direction of vibration that determines the shape of matter. But if it vibrates at a different frequency, then we're talking about a completely different universe altogether. What I'm saying, or what she said, and what was eventually accepted, it, was, it made scholars very uncomfortable, by the way, but they have to accept it because it was, it was, a, mathematical, uh, it was a, ma a mathematical mandate on them. It opened up the door for other parallel universes that exist within our universe, but we cannot see them because they vibrate at a different frequency. Now that opens up a door to a completely different understanding of alien life. Aliens don't necessarily live thousands of light, or millions of light years away, and they have to take a, 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 a you know, a, a hyper speed, hyper, hyper velocity across space, or wormholes, or whatever it is, Star Trek style, okay? Alien life could actually exist right next to you, and they are listening to a lecture in their masjid, in their own universe, to a guy that looks like me, but, you know, less handsome, <laughs> right? And that, in my judgment, redefines our notion of the word jinn. The Quran talks about uh, Iblis, right? About shaitan, multiple occasions. In one of them, it says, إِنَّهُ كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ an أَمْرِ رَبِّي And in another, so he was from the jinn, but he disobeyed his Lord. And in another one, it basically says, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمَ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسَ أَبَى he said to the angels, the angels this time, not jinn, the angels, prostrate to, to Adam, the, all of them obeyed except shaitan, except Iblis. He's the only one that refused. Okay, so we need to decide, is Iblis uh, an angel or is he a jinn? Now, at the time of Ibn Kathir, there was, it was impossible for them to understand that he could actually be both. If you understand the word jinn in its wider sense, ma janna anil ayn, something that is hidden or is not seen by the naked eye, right? Then anything that we cannot see is considered jinn. So the angels would be considered jinn. Uh, any other beings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made of fire or energy would be considered jinn. Bacteria, viruses, anything that I cannot see would be considered. You know who argues that, by the way? And he was attacked by the scholars of his time? Sheikh Muhammad Rashid Rida alayhi rahmatullah. In Tafsir al-Manar, he says, and he wrote this, by the way, in the 1920s, he says that jinn includes all the beings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that we cannot see, including angels and otherwise. Isn't that beautiful? So jinn could be beings that exist in other realms, in other universes, in other membranes, right? And the only thing is that we just, we can't see them.
There's this, um, there's this guy whose name is, um, is Alan Guth, uh, another, uh, another physicist, who basically talks about the expanding universe. Because there are so many membranes, there could be an infinite number of membranes, and I'll refer that to Surat Fusilat, inshallah, in a second. There's an infinite number of membranes, right? In every membrane, there is a, a, a solar system that is similar to ours. There is a sun that is similar to ours. There is an earth that is similar to ours. There is Muhammad and Huda and Michael and George and, and Sebastian, right, that are similar to ours. And within all of those universes, every possibility that could have happened here but didn't happen will happen there. Okay? So if in this universe, in one second, I will raise my right hand, in another universe, Imam Aziz will raise his left hand. Or doesn't raise his hand, hand at all. Or cancels the khatira or gets really, really sick and goes home, or gets extremely rude and just walks on everyone and leaves, right? There is an infinite number of possibilities of what I have, could have done in the upcoming one second, no? There's an, you, you could never guess what I, what I was planning to say or do. There's an infinite number of things. So those infinite number of possibilities would be replicated in every universe according to, according to Alan Guth. Right? Isn't that absolutely fascinating and remarkable? <laughs> Now, here is, here is one last notion. So I talked to you about string theory and M theory. By the way, M theory, as, as Ed Witten calls it, it is not just membrane theory. He called it M theory because he wanted to keep the confusion so people can call it the magical theory, the majestic theory, the mother theory, you know, whatever it is, just leave it to people's imagination, so to speak. One last thing, inshallah, that I need to talk about before I go back to the ayah, and that is the God particle. What is that? It's a very, very complex notion of physics that I, we don't have time to go into detail. But what this, in order to prove string and M theories in the lab, the scholars the, the, of physics, they need to do something very simple at face value. They need to take two particles and cause them to move very fast and collide with each other at hyper speeds, and then calculate the energy that comes out of this collision. Some of that energy will become kinetic energy, some of it will become heat, some of it will become whatever. If they can calculate the amount of energy that comes out of this collision and realize that some of it is still missing, then that missing amount of energy went hiding into the dimensions. Then that energy went to hide into the microscopic dimensions and that basically proves the theory mathematically and also in the lab. So they calculated the amount of energy that will basically go out from the collision. They calculated the amount of energy that would go and hide in the, the, the uh, additional seven dimensions. And they built this massive collider in Geneva, uh, um, Switzerland, uh, at the cost of like $10 billion. They have been trying it in the US for a while, you know, and, and to no avail. And in July of 2012, uh, European scientists managed to cause those two particles to collide and when they calculated the amount of energy that was lost they realized that it mimicked exactly the amount of energy they calculated and that basically established the theory uh, uh, in, in the lab as well that true there are 11 dimensions and not just four as we thought. Another thing that came out of this theory which is the Higgs boson and that is the God particle as they say and this is an extremely complex notion you probably need to read a lot about this. But they argue that the Higgs boson basically came about when two membranes touched each other billions and billions of years ago. So the universe was created, they argue, when two membranes touched each other. And of course, you have two membranes with different frequencies touching each other. And, and, and when they touched each other, it created that very first particle of existence. And that is the Higgs boson. And then something happened to the Higgs boson that gave rise to the universe, and that is the Big Bang. The Big Bang. You see how it all connects to each other? Okay. So that is why it was very important for them to figure out the existence of the Higgs boson, the boson membrane, and stuff like that in, uh, in the experiment in, in Geneva, because they needed to prove, because they say that Higgs boson basically is the particle that gives any other particle its own mass. See, we used to think that mass is something that actually exists, that you can, that's tangible, that you can hold with your hands. Science proved that mass is just like charge. It is a quality of the particle that is given to it by something else, 
as opposed to being intrinsic as we've always thought. But you know, never mind that. That is, not even, that is not even important. How is all of that related to the ayah? Number one, you know, the, the, basically the one that, that I recited to you from Surah Fussilat was, was, pretty, was pretty straightforward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى السَّمَاءِ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَهَيَا دُخَانٌ فَقَالَ لَهَا وَلِلْأَرْضِ اِتِيَا طَوْعًا أَوْ كَرْهَا قَالَتَا أَتَيْنَا طَاعِي فَقَضَاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَوَاتٍ وَأَوْحَى فِي كُلِّ سَمَاءٍ سَبْعَ سَمَوَاتٍ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ وَأَوْحَى فِي كُلِّ سَمَاءٍ أَمْرَهَا وَزَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ وَحِفْظَةً ذَلِكَ تَقْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically says that as sama and I described this to you yesterday and I established that in my understanding as sama is the universe. It is not the, 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 the atmosphere, it is not our cosmic system as sama is our universe. as sama is our membrane. Now that you understand M-theory, I feel comfortable to say Sab'i Samawat, and as I said yesterday night, in the language of the Arab, Sab'i means many. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to say that I have created many universes. And the proof of this is that the ayah says, وَلَقَدْ زَيَّنَّ السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ وَحِفْظَةً We have ornamented the nearest of the skies to you with the stars. Which means that every single star you see out there is part of our immediate sky, our immediate cosmic system, our immediate universe. All the stars you see are members of our own membrane. Because they vibrate within our same frequency. That's why we can see them. Which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created other universes as well. Okay? Now, the ayah in Surah Al-Talaq says something that is even more interesting. Allah الذي خلق سبع سماوات ومن الأرض مثلهن يتنزل الأمر بينهن He created the seven heavens or the seven skies or the seven universes or many many universes and multi, multiverses and I created seven earths as well. I created many earths as well. What do we make of this? Remember I said earlier what Guth says that there are so many universes out there and every universe has an earth like us and, every, and, and there's a guy just like you or a girl just like you over there doing the stuff that you haven't done here. Following every single possibility that you could have followed here that you haven't, that you haven't followed. So many universes and every universe there are many stars and many earths and many people and so on and so forth. SubhanAllah. How do we establish the validity? Science talks about this already. And they could exist within our same existence, but they just vibrate at a different frequency. Listen to what Abdullah ibn Abbas says. And this hadith about Abdullah ibn Abbas is actually sahih. It is mentioned in, in, in almost every hadith book. Al-Bayhaqi, however, sahib al-hadith, he, he criticized this hadith so much, even though he could not argue with the sanad of the hadith. He couldn't argue with the, with the chain. He just says this hadith doesn't make sense. Abdullah ibn Abbas would never say something like this. When Abdullah ibn Abbas asked about this ayah in Surah Al-Talaq, he basically says to his students, Allah Azza wa Jalla khalaqa sab'an min al-aradi mithla ardikum. Wa fi kulli wahidatin minha adamu mithla adam. Wa Isa mithlu Isa. Wa Musa mithlu Musa. Wa Ibrahimu mithlu Ibrahim. ومحمد مثل محمدكم وعبد الله بن عباس مثل عبد الله بن عباسكم. Can you believe this? Have you ever heard this hadith before? Not a single person. He basically says in his tafsir of the ayah in Surah Al-Talaq, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created many earths and in every earth there is an Adam like your Adam, there's a Musa like yours, there's Isa like yours, Ibrahim like yours, there's a Muhammad like yours and even Abdullah ibn Abbas like your Abdullah ibn Abbas telling you the story. Right now. That was the understanding of one of the students of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine the knowledge and the ilm of Rasulullah himself alayhi salatu wasalam. Could he have shared such knowledge with the people of his time very clearly as we speak about it today? Probably not. It would have basically flown over their heads. They, they, they have no alphabet of science to be able to understand and, and, and perceive of, of these extremely complex. I mean, look at us here. In the year 2013, and most people in, 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 in the masjid are listening to this stuff with their jaws dropped. 
And 50% of what I said is probably stuff that you guys didn't understand. And you need to listen to this khatara many times and go back and read and really expand your knowledge on it. Imagine if you go to the simple Bedouins of the desert and talk to them about these things. Okay? All the knowledge you've given is very little and small anyway. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every generation gives that generation just a tiny bit more of knowledge. And by the time we have enough knowledge of the world, of existence, that is the time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inherits the world and everything that is in it. One last thought, inshallah, before we stand up again for prayer. The, the core concept of the Big Bang theory is that the universe started off from this very, very small particle and grew into something that is so huge, right? Now, do, we, do you agree with me or not that the universe continues to expand? That is, that is a, an accepted fact of science, right? And at some point, the expansion is going to so stop, come to a halt, and then it'll start receding again. It'll start contracting again. Isn't that exactly what the Quran says? Again, again he uses the word as sama. We have created the skies, the membranes, with our own hands, and they continue to expand. It doesn't get more accurate than that. Okay? Even the notion of Guth, when he says that, uh, that the possibilities in this universe are different than the possibilities in the other universe, and then you are uh, a, a, a twin in, in, in the other membrane does stuff that you don't do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says in the Quran about that uh, very, very notion uh, 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 that, that he basically establishes what he wants to establish and he deletes what he wants to delete. يَمْحُ اللَّهُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيُثْبِتْ وَعِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ الْكِتَابِ Ya Allah. It's as if the infinite number of choices and possibilities for every human being are available in a book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can look at and he decides which of those possibilities will be followed in this universe and which will be followed in that universe. If you have the heart and the mind and the curiosity to read the Qur'an and delve and, and understand it and extract the lessons and the beauty, you will live a happy life, I can promise you that. Because this is a long time adventure of learning that will give you nothing but amazement every single day. لا تنقضي عجائبه As one of the kuffar said in his description of the Qur'an, the wonders of the Qur'an never cease, they never stop. There isn't a time that will ever come that you go and open up the Qur'an and you're not amazed by something and you read something as if you're reading it for the first time. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our knowledge of His great and amazing book. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among Ahlul Qur'an, to make us among those who love the Qur'an, those who are inspired by the Qur'an, those whose faith is strengthened by the Qur'an. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to admit us into his Jannah with those who memorized and uh, understood and implemented the Quran. Allahumma ameen. I say this, 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 I say this